loud, but I got your attention. I got your attention. Hey, y'all, I'm Julie Salva. Welcome this Sunday to Hermitage Hills. We are so glad that y'all are here. I have a couple things that I want to do. First of all, I want to say hi to you. Hello. Does anybody want to say hi to me? Thank you. Thank you. The next thing that I want to tell you is this. If you are here and you are a member at Hermitage Hills, you've been visiting a while, don't forget at 5 o'clock today, in the loft, there's a gathering. What is a gathering, you may ask? A gathering is where people gather, where people gather, and where we talk business of the church, we learn what's going on in the church, we hear stories of life change, we hear mission reports, it's going to be great. So if you want to come to that, or even if you don't, come. It's at 5 o'clock in the law. Hey, we're glad you're here in person. My online friends, we are so glad that you have joined us online as well. We have the privilege right now, though, of participating in one of the most exciting things in all of people's faith journeys, and that is baptism. I'm going to turn it over to Bobby, and let's get ready to celebrate. Good morning. Well, good morning. This is an exciting morning. We have the opportunity to share in a baptism and to celebrate. This is Tommy Gilbert. Uh, Tommy is 80 years old, and um, he's been attending our church for the past three or four years. And during that time here, he walked through a journey of cancer and just saw a miraculous healing in his body um, and in his soul as God worked in his life through that, that battle with cancer. And then as he was in kind of rehab afterwards, Andy Miller c connected with him, and they got to share and talk. And he came forward, I think, about a month ago um, and asked to get baptized. Now, he was saved and baptized when he was a young person, when he was 13, 14 years old. But this is signifying a reconnection with God as he walked through that cancer and God spoke to him, and he began to spend more time in God's word and, and he told me that, that there was more clarity now in, as he reads God's word and understands that God's speaking to him through that. So he wanted to come and share with you in baptism and with family and friends. We have a lot of people on stage here that he's connected with, and we appreciate that. Um, so, Tommy, have you trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes, sir. Is it your desire to follow him all the days of your life? Yes, sir. Then based on your profession of faith and in obedience to our Lord's command, it is my privilege and honor to baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. Thank you. Let me get out of the way. Let's pray as we move towards just worshiping our Lord and Savior. Lord, we're grateful for this testimony, a testimony of, of Tommy following you. We're grateful for what it symbolizes. You laid down your life for us. You were buried and raised so that we could follow you. And after we follow you, we, we turn our lives over to you and we symbolize it with baptism. And Lord, I just pray that each of us, if we're followers of Christ, would recognize the power of what you've done in our lives and that our hearts would be to follow you every day of our life. And Lord, if there are those in here who are not following you, that they would have seen something and recognize the power of who you are. Lord, work in their lives this morning as we worship as we study your word, in Christ's name, amen. Come on and put your hands together for the Lord this morning. Let's bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. Yeah. the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings yeah who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless and awe and wonder the king of glory, the king 
above all kings. Let's sing it real big. This is amazing grace. Yeah. This is unfailing love. Oh, that you would take my place. God, yeah. That you would bear my cross. You lay down, you lay down your life. Oh, yes, you did. That I Come to celebrate our King. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Yeah. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of his brilliance, the king of glory, the king above all kings, yeah. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. Yeah, you lay down you your life. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Sing it with me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. Yeah, this is unfailing love. Yes, it is that you, that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. That you would bear my cross. and put your hands together if he's done something for you. Hallelujah. We serve a faithful God. He's faithful through the ages. And God, we bless you today, God. God, we thank you for being faithful. You're faithful to your promises, Lord. Hallelujah. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant. Faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me from the rising sun to the setting same i will praise your name god great is your faithfulness to
God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is, great is your faithfulness to me. Say grateful. So I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never Lift our hands for, for our God. Because he's been faithful. God, you are faithful. Great is thy faithfulness. Oh, God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning. Thou changes not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. 
faithful. He is faithful. He is faithful. God, we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. God, we thank you that all that we need, your hand, your hand has provided. Your hand has provided, God, everything that we need, God, everything that we want, everything, God, your hand has provided. God, and we look to you. We look to you, God, and we thank you, and we bless you because you are faithful. God, I pray that you will ready our hearts for the word. God, as the man of God comes, God, to deliver your word, God, we pray that it falls on good ground and that we will receive it and not only hear it, but go into the world and do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning, church. Great to see you. Great to be back at this spot today. So thankful for Pastor Andy and Bobby uh, bringing the word the last couple of weeks. As I was in Alaska with some of the greatest people on the planet, I tell you what, we had a great, great, great time. We invite you right now at home or in the room, reach out and grab that Bible you brought with you to worship, either in paper or in digital Form. In just a moment, we're going to have you uh, stand in honor of God's Word. Turn to Revelations chapter 2. If this is your first Sunday, or maybe you haven't been back in a few weeks, we're on a series in June and July called The Church, Its Victories and Its Challenges. The seven churches that Jesus talked about in the book of Revelation, as recorded by John, we're taking Sunday by Sunday, taking a look at each and every of these churches and saying, what did Jesus tell them? What was his word for them? What did he have to offer them? Where was that way to go, church? And where was that, oops, church, you may be missing it here. What was true then has been true through the ages. So have your Bible open to Revelations chapter 2. In just a moment, I'm going to read verses 12 through 17. So here we have this place recorded. We're not talking about so much the end times in this series. If you were looking forward to that, I'm sorry. That will have to come with the next pastor because we're not going to get to there. All right? But we're talking about these seven churches here in the last couple of months, like I said. So let's stand together. Let me read from Revelations chapter 2. This third church and what God's word has to give us about this church, about what Christ had to say to them and also say to us. Verse 12, Revelation chapter 2. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword, I know where you dwell where Satan's throne is, yet you hold fast my name, and you did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, 
who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Verse 14, but I have a few things against you. Uh Uh-oh, right? Uh Uh-oh, but I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel so that they might eat food, sacrifice to idols, and practice sexual immorality. So also you have some who hold the teaching of Nickelodeon. Therefore, repent. If not, I will come to you soon and war against them with the sword of my mouth. In each of the churches, he says the same phrase, he who has a what? Ear. Let him what? Hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except the one who receive it. This is the Lord's word. This is the word straight from our Savior's mouth. This is the word for then and the word for day. This is the word that we believe and the word that we must follow. This is the word that God gives to the church. May we be faithful in knowing, understanding, following, yielding to the truths we find in his word. Amen, church? You can be seated. So our our first church, Pastor Annie, again, did a great job. But the key phrase there amongst that passage in the first church that Jesus spoke about is how they had abandoned their first love. It wasn't that they left their first love, but they abandoned their first love. There's a huge difference between those two sayings, yes? If you leave something or you left something, sometimes that happens by accident. How many of you can relate to this by when you got in your car, started driving down the road, and you looked for your phone, you couldn't find it? Come on. How many of you have been in that moment, you're like, oh, oh, shoot, where's my phone? It wasn't that you abandoned your phone, you what? You left your phone. And what's crazy today is we could be like halfway to work or halfway to where we're going and we'll turn around and go back to get what? A phone. But again, the point is that the first church, many things he had to encourage them with and bless them with and thank them for, he did have this one challenge before them. And that is they had abandoned their first love. Now, I don't think they set out one day and go, this is what we're going to do. It just happens over time. Church, may we be very careful today as he was encouraging the church then to make sure our first love remains our first love. Our first priority remains our first priority. And it is to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love our neighbors, we love ourselves. Thus is the gospel of Jesus Christ. To stay deeply in love and connected to God and his plan and his purpose and his word, no matter what it may give us. The second church, Bobby did great last week about knowing about the persecutions and the trials and the tribulations that are coming for the church. Let me tell you, folks, this is unfolding before us. This truth is relayed in our lives today. I'm not saying we're living in end times, but I'm saying we're really close. The world that we're living in and the trials that are here and the persecution, listen, that is coming. And I'm not trying to put a spirit of fear in you. I'm not trying to scare you. I do want to be faithful in teaching you and allowing the truth of the Scripture to come forth. And that is this. As we look at the next decade, be ready. Be ready. We are walking in the midst of of days and times and trials and tribulations. And that which was popular is now unpopular. And that which was seen as the Bible belt, the gospel belt, has slowly losing its influence and its impact. The church, your family, under great, great persecution. Today we're going to talk about The fact that sometimes if we're not careful, we can allow compromise to recreate conflict. 
Because the church here in Pergamum, this church was facing some difficult situations in a difficult time. And I'm going to say so boldly as to what some of the things they were facing are identical to the things that we're facing today. Maybe in a different way, a di different tactic, a different source, a different avenue, a different path. But much of what you and I are dealing with in faith and in the journey of faith is much of what they also had as well. So there's three things I want you to see today. Number one, when you look at the road of life that God has given us to live and experience, because Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it how? More abundantly. This life, first of all, I want you to know the, the road of life has guardrails. The road of life has guardrails. Now let me, let me premise these things that we're going to unfold today, these things that we're going to see in the book of Revelation, these things to the churches and this church and our church. I want you to see ahead of time, get ready, buckle up, get ready, because there is some tough stuff in this passage. There is some difficult things to hear. There are things that possibly we have abandoned over time and we have watered down and we're trying to be more relatable and we're trying to be so kind and we should be, but we're, we're missing some of the foundational principles and truths in the Scriptures. And, it's, and listen, this has become unpopular, not just in the, I'm not talking about the world, it's unpopular in the church. Things that we accept today that we should have never accepted. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't love. You should always what? Love. We should always love. But not to the expense that we back away or back down or ignore or abandon truth. So first of all is the road of life has guardrails. Look at verse 12. So the angel is speaking, Christ is speaking to this church, Pergamum, and it starts out with this phrase, the words of him who is Jesus, who has the sharp two-edged sword. All right, so when you read this, I'm not quite sure how you think about it or what, how that relates to you or what, what hits you with that. But I don't know, if anybody comes up to me with a sharp two-edged sword, I'm kind of going, okay. What's, what's getting ready to happen? Now watch this. The word guardrail that I'm using here is from the term that says, a rail that prevents people from falling off are being hit by something. Y'all know the guardrails of life, right? You drive down the road, you see the guardrails. How many of you, raise your hand, how many of you have seen the guardrail that's been smashed? You ever seen those? You know, like, what happened? Well, somebody lost sight. Somebody, something happened somewhere. I'm not saying right or wrong, good or bad. I'm just saying somewhere they got off the path. Now, obviously, I'm talking about spiritual guardrails that will never let you down. Because I know that human guardrails will. Because I remember years ago on a college trip snow skiing to Vermont, we took a bus over a cliff and it went right straight through a guardrail. Right smack through it. Didn't stop, didn't bump, didn't hiccup. We just went right through it. But that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a spiritual guardrails that God has given us. Now look at me. Now notice this. The scripture speaks about how what God has for us is found on a narrow path. Do you know the verse? Wide is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life and peace. Now for me personally, this is not a theological statement, but but for me personally, it seems that the narrow way is getting more narrow and the wider way is getting more wide. That's just my opinion. 
Now, biblically speaking, it's the same. I get that. But we are living in a time where the road of life we need to see has specific guardrails. See, the church has always faced lifestyle issues, cultural trends, and the adversary's constant bombardment to water down and ignore biblical truth. Notice what he says here. He says, this sharp two-edged sword speaks in verse 13. This very first word, he says, I know where you dwell. I know where you live. I know what you're dealing with. I know what's amongst you. And look what it says, where Satan's throne is. I know where you're living around. I know what you're living amongst. You are amongst the very place. You're living in a place where we would call it the very, the very spot of Satan himself, the adversary himself. It is his throne is placed in your city. Does that make you gasp a little bit? What if Christ said to you, man, I know where you are. You're living in the midst of the evil one's presence. The very throne, earthly throne of the adversary is where you are. He goes on, he says, but you're holding fast. Way to go. You're not denying the faith. Yes, good for you. Even the days of Antipas, the faithful witness who was killed among you. Man, you've seen so much, you've experienced so much because you are where Satan dwells. There are these guardrails even where Satan dwells. Think of that for a moment. I can't think of a more difficult place to be as a church or a follower of Christ who desires to carry the gospel to the highways and the byways, but to know you're at the very place, the very spot that Jesus says Satan dwells. I, I think at this point, they're reading this letter from Jesus to John to this church and it's being read before them. I think right now there is a hush amongst the crowd. Oh, my goodness. We're, we're so thankful that you're so grateful for our faith and our journey. We're so grateful for the fact that there are those who've been martyred before us and probably will be martyred after us. We're grateful for the faithfulness of those who've been around us. We're, though we're in the place, we're in the spot. We're in this incredible spot. Pergamum, this city was known to be one of the major intellectual places in the Roman Empire. Are you ready for this? Listen to this. It had a library. How many of y'all like to go to the library? Raise your hand. Come on, be honest. Yeah. It had a library. You, you people, you book people. It had a library of over 200,000 scrolls. Do you know anything about a scroll? I mean, it's, it's a lot longer, a lot thicker, a lot bigger, a lot bulkier than a book. It had, it had in its possession, this, this library had over 200,000 scrolls. Scrolls. And with that came this prideful, puffed up mentality amongst the cities, of the citizens of this city of Pergamum, that we are the intellectual ones. As a result, it was a place that was known for mental strength, which was found much of the pagan worship that engulfed the region and beyond. You see, the church then was facing much of the same as the church today, intellectual pride that is leading the path to ignoring and violating biblical truth. Are you following me? Are you following the thought? Are you following the process? This third church in Pergamon, known to be one of the wisest centrally located uh, cities of 200,000 scrolls and knowledge and education and PhDs and great, great smarts. But it was also known to be highly engaged in some of the most 
uh, radical pagan religions and following. The pride of intellect will lead you to a compromise of truth, and that compromise of truth will lead you to conflict. I don't know about you, but I read through this, and I've thought about this, and hopefully you're engaging your brain. It's so easy to let the intellectual understanding and knowledge really to get in the way of the path of truth. Just because it's been written in a book doesn't make its truth unless that book is the Bible. And much of the truths that have been written in the books today are now being changed to say what it used to say to something completely different today. All in the name of intellectual knowledge and pride. You see, there were these guardrails that Jesus was setting before them as a church. You must know what these guardrails are. This is where he uses this word, two-edged sword. Why this phrase? The sword is a symbolic representation of the word of God. And it's twofold ability to separate believers from the world and to condemn the world for its sin. I told you it was going to be difficult. But the truth and reality of what God has given us in his holy scripture, in his love letter to us, the word of God has the ability to separate us from the world and its influences and to condemn the world for its sin. Listen, make no mistake about it. What God has given you is to direct you, it's to teach you, it's to guide you. It's to comfort you. It's to help you. But listen closely. It's also to convict you and to correct you and to put you on the path that is more glorious to his name. Yes? This is the struggle of the church. This is where Jesus is addressing this church. He said, I'm the one with this sharp two-edged sword. We first see this truth in first. The chapter 1, verse 16, if you'll flip back to chapter 1, verse 16, John reveals the one who is coming to speak to these seven churches and write these letters. The first part of the book of Revelation, this one who is he. Chapter 1, verse 16, in his right hand he held seven stars. From his mouth came a what? Sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Make no mistake about it. This sharp two-edged sword is the very words that Jesus was giving them. Do you remember how that's so important? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word came and dwelt among us, and we beheld us glory full of grace. Yes, and what? Say it with me. Grace and? One more time. Come on. Grace and? Both are coming from the sharp two-edged sword. Our is the church today. In the church then, are we being faithful to the truths of the two-edged sword? Look at Hebrews 4.12. I think it's coming up on the screen. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is what? Living and active. Sharper than any what? (laughs) Don't you love the Bible? I just love the Bible. I love how it just, from the getting, the man that... All the way through it, it just has an incredible story that's unfolding for us. The Word of God is this sharp, two-edged sword. And it what? Pierces to the divisions of the soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It was true then and is true today. 
See, the first, there must be in our hearts and minds that the road of life is not a road that's wide. It is a road that's narrow. And this narrow word has boundaries that God gives us. Now, let me tell you something. It's really important for your faith journey that you grab a hold of this. That you grab a hold of the truth and the value and the authority of the scriptures that God has given us. The church then and the church now. He was warning them and he's warning us. There are the guardrails of life. And listen, when you drive down the road, you may see a guardrail and go, why is it there for? It doesn't matter. It's there. Sometimes you drive down a road and you look like, whoa, 3,000 feet down. I know why that got really. It's obvious, right? But sometimes you hit a turn, you hit a spot, you hit a place, there's a guardrail. You're going, hmm, let me tell you something. Probably it's there because someone uh, went through that place when it wasn't there, and so they decided to put one up. It's not for me to judge should the guardrail be there or not. What's for me is to obey and see the guardrail and to drive my life between it. It's not about me agreeing or disagreeing or having any word in the guardrail. You see, we don't walk this journey of faith without the biblical guardrail of truth. To know the truth, to understand the truth, and to follow the truth. Why? To keep us from falling off the edge. Can you look at me today? The world is tumbling down a cliff. And you and I are facing issues and cultural trends and for the intellect way of life. And we're losing the design and the call and the purpose of our God. Do you remember this bumper sticker? I think it's up on the screen. Do you see it? Do you remember this one? Boy, I'm dating myself here, aren't I? This goes back a while. But I think we need to bring this one back into the full motion. God settled it. I, I mean, God said it. I believe it. What happens? It's not God recommended it. I thought about it. And then I'll see what happens. It's God gave it to you. God has said it. God has bestowed it upon you. God has written it before you. Jesus is speaking to you. There are guardrails from the two-edged sword of the Savior of the world. He's put them in place, and they're there for your safety, and they're there for a purpose, and they're there for a reason. It's not for me to decide whether I'll try to stay within the guardrail if it fits my desire more than, you know what, God has said it. I may not get it, but it's settled. This is the warning to the church they had drifted. Well, how can you say that? How can you say that? Well, look at the Bible. Look at verse 14. So he gives this encouraging, loving word and, and this obvious, man, you're in the midst of Satan's throne where Satan dwells. And you're holding fast to my name. And, and, and you do not deny the faith. And, man, even when one was killed, you hung in there. I mean, woo, yes. Then verse 14, but... But I have a few things to speak to you about. I have a few things to draw to your attention. I have a few things for you to know. You see, not only is the road life has guardrails, but second, the road of life has stop signs. The road of life has stop signs. Now, the most important thing, Steve Sacrapani, the most important thing about a stop sign is when cars approach it, they're supposed to what? Stop. Don't look at me like that. 
Come on. Come on. We got that thing called the rolling stop. Uh-huh. How many, be honest before God, and your wife and your husband, and your children, how many of you have ever been pulled over for the rolling stop? Me? Huh? Come on. It happens, right? We know there's a stop sign. We know what it says. We know what it means. And Steve affirmed it as a state trooper of all of America. He has said a stop sign means legally you are to stop. Look, then proceed. That is the rule. That is the guardrail. That is the place. That is its purpose. It's not for you to say, oh, I think I'll just roll up here and go, hmm, okay, let's keep going. <laughs> Listen to me. Listen to me. If you and I are not careful, that's exactly how we could treat the Word of God. It's just a rolling stop. I notice it, I see it, I, I know what it's there for, but you know what? I'm like Ford, I got a better idea. And I'm just going to ease up and take a look and keep moving. The only way you obey the stop sign is if you what? Stop. Not partial stop, not almost stop. Not get as close to stopping, but not stopping. It's just got to stop. See, here's what's important. We can treat the Word of God, if we're not careful, like we do the rolling stop. Oh, I'm going to tweak it here a little bit and a little bit there. I'm going to be partially obedient. I, I think this is really going to be okay. Now, I want you to see a couple of things that he draws out. Now, this is not a complete list, right? Jesus is not giving you a complete stop list here. But he does go to some specific things, and he had to have a reason why he went these specific things. So I need you to listen. I need you to see in the Bible. I need you to see what Jesus is saying. Because I'm merely a voice piece for him. I didn't, I didn't come up with this. The first stop is this. Stop listening to the wrong voices. Stop listening to the wrong voices. He says in the scripture, you have some who hold the teaching of Balaam and Balak and are making the people stumble. Verse 14, you can see it right there. Teaches of Balaam who taught Balak and that became a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. I have this against you. Some of you are listening to the wrong voices. Now, Balaam and Balak is recorded in Numbers 22 through 25. I do not have time to go to all that today. Write that down, Numbers 22 to 25, and read it for yourself. The story of Balak and the story of Balaam. But basically what was happening is this, this time around, they, they knew. They were, familiar with, they were familiar with these truths. He didn't have to explain it to them. But basically... The two were leading the people into idol worship and sexual fornication, even to the point of temple prostitutes. Balak and Balaam. They were listening to their voices. They were listening to those of their voices. They were listening to those voices who were saying, you know what? It's okay to have your Jesus thing. But there's others too. There's other things. And all kinds of pagan and idol worship was happening in this city. The city of intellect. The city of knowledge. In the truth of God's love and the person of Christ was being diminished and avoided and spoken Either less or not at all. And Jesus says, I got this one thing against you. You are listening to the wrong voices. This practice of sexual immorality. I told you what they were facing are similar to what we're facing today. Will you give me liberty to speak about some of this right now? 
Will you allow me to talk about some stuff that's just hard? And listen, if this touches your life in some form or fashion, it's not that we're trying to say God doesn't love you because God does love you. But somehow, even in the own American church, we have gone more to the pride side of intellectual assent than biblical truth. Because growing up, I used to hear, and it was common in agreement, that men and women didn't have sex until they were married. It was common. It was taught. It was proclaimed. Consistently, lovingly, passionately, men and women don't have sex until they're married. Where did that go? Where, where, where did that fall off the radar? Even some online or in the room, you're going, dude, you are ancient. You are so old. You must be on Medicare. And I am. <laughs> but the guardrail is still the guardrail. Amen. And we're living in a world that we think, well, it's okay. It's not. It's one man, one woman, one life. Has been, always will be. And some are you saying, why are you even talking about this? Because listen, I'm on Facebook. I see it. Two unmarried people in the same hotel room. Duh. Two married people at the same beach in the same condo. Duh. Don't hand me. We're in different bedrooms. Bah humbug. I don't believe that for a second. Sorry. This was Jesus was speaking, sexual immorality. Where is it that somehow or another married couple can step outside the boundaries of their relationship and commitment to Christ and have relationships with other people of a sexual nature and we don't say anything about it? I told you it's going to be hard. Marriage is a holy thing that a holy God has made, and it should remain holy. And if you struggle there, then let's get some help. It's not okay for a follower of Jesus to step outside their marital commitment and have sex with other people. But where has that gone? Where have we spoken about that? Where have we said that? Where do you hear that common amongst the day? It's not. At least in the world I'm living in. Listen to the right voices. You see, I think what Jesus is saying is be careful. Be diligent. Be picky. Do not allow just anyone the availability to speak into your heart and speak into your life and help you make your choices. This truth has become even a bigger challenge with the access to the internet and there are so many voices. Could I throw out the stop sign that says, evaluate, verify, answer the question, is this biblical? I had a guy stop me one time. He goes, you son of a Baptist. Now listen, I, I love our convention. I know, but we got some crazy uncles. We got some crazy stuff. I get that. But he came to me and says, you son of a Baptist, why do you stress things being biblical so much? <laughs> I said, what? He says, you son of a Baptist. He's like, it's biblical. It's biblical. It's biblical. I said, well. What are we doing if it's not?
Now, I don't exactly knew what he was trying to detour there, but I, never mind, go on. Second stop, first stop, stop listening to the wrong voices. Second stop, stop yielding to the wrong vices. Stop yielding to the wrong vices. He says here, some hold to the teaching of Nicolotian. This was a suggestion that was being taught to the Christians to engage again in sexual immorality, adultery, homosexuality, and prostitution. Even outside the temple, there was prostitutes, and a part of the religious journey was to engage in a sexual encounter with this prostitute in the name of religion. And this was taught as being a permissible pathway for a follower of Jesus. However, the Christians knew then, and we know today, that what God's Word is teaching us is outside of those perimeters. Jesus was telling them that this must stop, a complete stop, and not a rolling stop. A yield to the truths of Scripture from the very beginning that God made one man, one woman, one life. Listen, so don't go crazy with me on this one. There is a lot of other things that can fit into this category. Are you with me? I'm just reaching out from the scripture and pulling out the ones that he spoke about. But there's a lot of other areas in life and the journey that also could fit in this parameter of the stop signs. Life has guardrails, life has stop signs. And then third, I want you to see the road of life has U-turns. The road of life has you turns. Look at verse 16. So he pronounces this, way to go, but, and then he says, here's your response, verse 16. Therefore, what? Repent. Therefore, help me church, what? Therefore, what church? We don't even like say to do we? Therefore, Repent. See, U-turn is the intentional turning directions in a U-shaped course so as to face in the opposite direction. The road of life has a U-turn moment and moments of this wonderful biblical reality and truth that doesn't yield to the intellect and to pride, but yields to humbleness and the authority of God in his word in our lives where we see it, we admit it, and we repent of it. The word repent here in the Greek is a word that says denoting a change of place or condition. To change the mind, it involves regret or sorrow accompanied by a true change of heart towards God. This word repent occurs 12 times in Revelation. Eight of them, eight times, it's in the seven churches. This word is found to be in the aorist tense. Now, again, voice, tense, mood. Y'all remember I've taught you this for years and years and years. Greek has voice, tense, and mood. Helps you understand the significance and the meaning of the word. Voice, tense, and mood. The tense of this word repent is what's called the aorist tense. Meaning, listen, to give urgent attention to it right now. When Jesus said, therefore repent, he was calling them to come to him in a sense of urgency. To deal with what is happening in their hearts. Repent. It's in the imperative mood, meaning it was, please help me. It is a what imperative means, thank you, command. So watch this. The arrow's tense, urgency, imperative mood, it's a command. I command you with all urgency to repent. And the repentance was not just for those who engage in listening to the wrong voices or going to the wrong vices. Them, yes, but the church as a whole for saying, stand up, be counted. Follow Christ. Know his word. Surrender to his word. Be the people of God. Run against the flow. 
urgently I call upon the church to immediately and with all the command I can give you on the authority of the Father in heaven, you must repent. That kind of talk has left our churches decades ago. And we've gone to this 10 ways to make yourself happy. We're gone. Let's feel good. Make me feel good. Come on. I've had a hard week. Make me feel good. Man, God wants to. Listen, God makes to, God loves to make you feel good. Listen, the road to feeling good is through repentance. The road to feel good is through repentance. There's an individual repentance he calls them to. The people needed to repent of their defiance against God's truth by yielding to their own personal satisfaction is more important than completely submissioning to the truth of Scripture. Gosh, that was so good, I hope you write that down. The church repentance. The body of Christ needed to repent of their inability to speak truth in love, to allow for idol worship, sexual immorality, and participation in pagan ritual. The church needed to make a stand against the culture in a loving, compassionate, and kind but honest way, to give the truth of the Scripture in a society that was driven by sinful desires and living. He could have been sitting here today saying these same things. They're playing the keyboard, means I need to hush. So take your eyes to verse 17. We'll end with this. Ready? Verse 17. Every church it has said this. He repeats himself in every church. He repeats it, the conclusion, a little bit different twist, but he says these same words. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. It was true then, it is true today. He who has an ear, do you have the ability to hear the truth of Christ because you're a part of his family? Do you have a relationship with him that communicates to you his plan and his purpose for you as a part of his creation? Are you surrendering to that plan on a daily basis because Christ is your Savior and your Lord? He who has an ear. Then he says, let him who hear what the Spirit says. As a follower of Jesus, what has this text taught you today? What will you draw out? What will you repent of? What will you turn to? As you engage this incredible relationship through a heart of genuine honesty to the Savior of your heart and your life. He who has here, let him hear what the Spirit says. Look at the third thing. To the what? Churches. As a church, how can we more closely follow the truth of Scripture? And at the same time, listen, be kind, loving, and gentle in its presentation and its communication. Let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And I don't have time, but he goes on and says, now, the result of that is this hidden manna. Now, for those of you of the Bible, you can go back to manna in the Old Testament, and that can mean something to you. This hidden manna, and I will give you this white stone, and a new name were written on the stone, and no one except one who receives it. I, much there. Gosh. The road of life has guardrails, beloved. The road of life has stop signs, beloved. And the road of life has U-turns, beloved. Let him who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Me, you, us, locally, globally. You know I in this? Thus saith the Lord our God. Let's pray.
just a moment, we're going to sing a beautiful song together. It's a powerful song. It's a song of commitment, recommitment. A song of a Savior. A song of love, a song of grace, a song of truth, a song of repentance. A song that allows us to lift ourselves into His presence and receive His grace. Online, if you've never have come to a place of a personal relationship with God who loves you and a Jesus who died for you and a tomb that is empty, that changes everything for you, man, I just talk to the folks online and they'll take you to a chat room and have a conversation with you or give us a call this week. We'd love to sit down and have coffee or whatever and have more talks, more conversation. Those of us in the room, from the very top of the balcony, the very front row, what has God said? What is word? What has His Word said to you? What does His Word proclaim to you, mean to you? Do you know this relationship? Do you have an ear? Do you hear? Do you know? Do you have? And if you got any questions about knowing Jesus in a relationship, not a religion, but in a relationship, man, we'd love you to say yes to Jesus today, right there where you are, to repent of your sin and turn to the faithful one, the loving one, the gracious one, the kind one, the victorious one, Jesus. If you say yes today, we'd love to pray with you. We'd love to encourage you. While we sing, you have the freedom to step out from those pews and come and grab one of the hands of the folks down front. I promise you, we're not going to do anything you don't want to do. We'll have someone sit down and pray and encourage and read scripture to you, have conversation, help you take next steps. Maybe you know Christ, but you've never been baptized. When you, when you saw this beautiful picture today, you said, man, I need to do that. Don't hesitate. First word, first note of the song. Step out and say, I want to get baptized. Man, nothing would thrill the Lord and us more to see you step into those waters. Maybe you want to partner with us, connect to this place, move from guest to partner. We'd love to have you do that. Maybe you just want to come and pray. Holy Spirit of living God, fall fresh on this place. Your word has been read. Your word has been talked about. Your word has been given. Your word of truth breaks down walls and breaks every chain. Holy Spirit, living God, move in our midst as we worship, as we sing, as we adore, as we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Stand together. Let's sing. Let's respond. Let's be singing this. Let's let our hearts fill with thankfulness to the Father for his blood. Hallelujah. I was a wretch. I remember who I was. I was lost. I was blind. I was running out of time. Sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you had me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne. To build it here inside and there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed. Broke my chains, freed my soul, for the first time I had hope. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you. Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Yeah. 
took my place, lay inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, then you walked right out again. Now death has no sting, and life has no end. Hallelujah, for I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. into glorious life. Amen. Amen. Y'all can have a seat for just a minute. We're going to be done. I have a couple of things to tell you. Um, first of all, there may be somebody that said yes to Jesus today. There may be somebody that wants to have additional conversation about what that looks like. There may be somebody that's like, I don't really know what I feel, but I, I'm feeling different. I, I need to talk to somebody. If that's you, every week there's someone who fills out this I said yes card. If that's you, fill it out and just drop it off at the connection desk out back. And somebody will reach out to you for a conversation. Conversations can be scary, but it's just a conversation. So fill out that card. Another thing, if you want to know what is going on with Hermitage Hills, we've got the um, QR code here in the pew right in front of you. Or you can text the word CONNECT to 615-392-3322. So let's talk about camp for a minute. Let's talk camp. So here's the thing. So we had the children's camp this past week, and at that camp, so, so 28 kids went. It was away. They went. Parents were on sabbatical for three to four days while the kids went to camp. Out of those 28 kids, two children made decisions for salvation in Christ. Isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? And three other decisions were made for just what I just talked about, for conversation for conversation. The kids are like, let's just, I, I, I want to talk. So that's amazing. Now, what is equally amazing is that this coming week, our youth are going to camp. They're going to Fuge Camp. And I'm telling you, 
Fuge camp is not for the faint of heart. We don't get to go to Fuge camp. We, we can't hang, I'm just telling you. But they are going and they are gonna have an amazing time. So I would ask you, as you leave through the foyer, there are bands that you can get and put around your wrist. There's a name of a student on it. All you need to do is wear it and pray for them. Just pray for them. When the name pops into your head, pray for them. Because here's what we want. We want them to go to Fuge. We give so that students can go to Fuge. We love that students go to Fuge Camp. We want them to win all the games and run carrying the flag and do all the shaving cream things that they do and all of the stuff. We want all of the stuff. But we want Jesus more than the stuff. We want Jesus more than the stuff. And we know that there are going to be people there pouring into our youth and, and teaching them about Jesus. And lives can be changed and families can be impacted for eternity. And we want that to happen. And we're going to pray that the, the heavens open up and the Holy Spirit pours down. And you guys come back totally different. You're good now. But you come back different. So please take a, a wristband. You can also give as you're leaving. You can give on the QR code here. Why do you give? For Fuge. You give for Fuge. You give for Kids Camp. You give that we can walk out these doors and we can go to school partnerships and we can do the things that we do. Not so people look and say, look at Hermit of Chills. What are they all about? But so people can look and they can say, you know what? I, 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 saw, I saw something different from a church. I saw Jesus. I saw, I saw something today. That's why we give. So, friends, let's pray. Lord, you are so good. You are so good. Lord, everything hinges on the fact that, you, that, that you're good. When, when Jesus spoke to John in Revelation, like Pastor Poli talked about today, he did it because you're good. He didn't do it because he wanted to separate the people in those churches from you. He did it because you're good so they could repent and be back in relationship with you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you that you'll take what we give, Lord, and that you will multiply it and that you will put every penny exactly where it's meant to be, Lord. For your glory and your glory alone, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a great week.